all hits all the time. We are family. Max Scherzer, double digit K's. We're busting ours to kick yours. Fun to watch. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfect. From our respective apartments, it is the Mass and All Access Podcast brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. Paul Mancano and Bobby Blanco here with you. As always, coming to you during this uh, quarantine Wednesday, Bobby, we've got a lot to talk about here on this podcast. Uh, new baseball plan reported by ESPN. Got a lot of issues with that. But first off, how you doing? You know, doing well. Another okay. week in the books. Okay. Uh, feeling good. Um, I actually feel like I look better. Um, you do. On the podcast. Uh, big shout out to uh, my work from home <laughs> producer, Darlene Blanco, my mother, wow. for purchasing me a brand new uh, studio light. Um, so I feel like I am looking better on the screen and hopefully on whichever platform people are watching on. Yeah, on, you do. On, on live on Twitter. It looks like there is a sun directly in front of you, um, shining light upon your face. Yeah. Um, I also figured that uh, I used to be doing these podcasts on one of my computers and the camera wasn't up to snuff. So I switched to my iPad. Hopefully the camera's a okay. little better. Okay, well, it looks good so far. Um, yeah. Look, we are uh, we're producers, but we're used to producing in a studio, not in our homes. Uh, my yeah. at-home producer has been my girlfriend. She's done some lovely decorations, as you can see in the background, with uh, an Orioles jersey. Uh, got you can't see it, but there's a hula bird on the table over there. Yeah, we're uh, getting into some uh, some interesting territory. Um, question for you, Bobby. <laughs> Today is Wednesday. Yes. Which means it's a new episode yes. of uh, the show Little Fires Everywhere. Have you ever seen that show? No. Little Fires Everywhere? Yes. Uh, it is on no. HBO, um, which means it's a new episode today, which means my girlfriend's going to make me watch it. Um, I, I don't think it's a particularly good show, I'll be honest, uh, even though she's in the room and can hear me. Um, but, it, it, you know, Reese Witherspoon's in it. I think she's an executive producer. Um, just a lot of hateful kind of people on that show. But... The reason I bring it up, as you, your confused face, is because that's that's pretty much how I describe this new MLB plan. Little fires everywhere. I have issues mm -hmm. with the entire thing, as reported by ESPN. Um, it is a plan, in essence, if you haven't read the article, to bring baseball back potentially as early as May. Games would be played in Arizona. Players would be in relative isolation, away from their families for as much as up to four and a half months. Um, if a player contracts the coronavirus, he could be easily replaced by somebody else. Uh, there were other wacky ideas, including the player sitting out in the stands instead of in the dugout in an empty stadium, the umpire being six feet back, so you, the use of an electronic strike zone. Bobby, what are your thoughts on this insane deal? It, uh, well, it isn't insane. I mean, it's a. my first thought was reading through this uh, I read, I guess you read Jeff Passan's column on ESPN.com. I read uh, Ken Rosenthal's column on The Athletic, uh, uh, breaking it down as well. I'm guessing they had the same pretty much information. My, my first reaction was this will, never, this will never work. This cannot possibly work. But the more and more I sat on it and thought about it, it's just a starting point. It has to be. Like, there's no, and I think uh, Ken Rosenthal put it best at the end of his column when he said, a nation dealing with so much tragedy and uncertainty the plan still sounds like a long shot, but for baseball to be played in 2020, there might not be any other way. Um, I think that's a good way to put it. It's like, look, it's going to be wacky. If we play baseball this year, it's going to be out of the ordinary. It's going to be, you know, something we've never seen before because we're in uncircum like a very unusual times right now. So, yeah, I, I think it's like the first stepping stone to getting baseball back. Early as May, was that a bit of a reach? Yes. Players standing six feet apart in an empty stadium, is that a bit of a reach? Is that wacky? Yes, but it, it's a starting point at least. So I was with you. I was hot off the gas, like right on the, right from the start being like, this has never worked. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But the more I thought about it, I was like, you know what? They needed to start somewhere. It has to, if they're going to play baseball at all, 
it, there has to be a starting point somewhere. This has got to be that point, the first stepping stone, where they can then build upon it all um, and hopefully improve the, the plan and come up with something better, something a little more similar to ordinary. Yeah, I, I think it was clearly something that was just thrown out there. And obviously... It was reported not by MLB. It was, you know, it, it was reported by Jeff Passan and by Ken Rosenthal, the details of which. But when stuff like that gets out there, it's clear that Major League Baseball wants that stuff to get out there. They were kind of just right. throwing it uh, out there to see what the public reaction was going to be, I think, for the most part, which was similar to what I think they did with the idea of canceling the draft a few weeks ago, and then they took step ba- steps back. In this case, I think they're throwing it out there with the idea that they're throwing out there right now what sounds like the most ludicrous and dangerous, honestly, proposal of all of them because whatever they do decide is going to seem safer in, in, in uh, comparison to that deal. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of the opposite of you, Bobby. I, the more I sat and thought about it, kind of the more upset I got about it, thinking just the, the logistics of it would be ridiculous and it, truly impossible to pull off. You're talking about quarantining every single player that plays a game in Major League Baseball, putting them in their hotels, keeping them away from their families, maybe for the entire season if this thing is, isn't under control by the end of the, whenever the season would be. Then you're talking about all the people that interact with these players, uh, not just the coaches, the staff, the hotel workers. How about the people that work in the cafeterias in the hotel to make their breakfast? How about the people that clean their laundry on a daily basis? Are we quarantining all of those people and uh, saying you also can't see your family for an indefinite amount of time? You can't see your friends. You have to stay in the hotel or close by. Uh, And, you know, some of those people may need, would prefer that. Maybe they, if they need the money, if they want to support their families, I get that. But it's just an impossible task to ask for all of this to go down. But besides the logistics point, the biggest issue I have with it is it, it almost sounds like a Hunger Games-like proposal of would you be willing to go away from your family and be put in a remote location in the, in the desert, in Arizona, in a hotel, away from your family for an extended amount of time just to entertain people. I mean, really, that's what it is. It's, and, and, you know, the, the money that you would get from a TV contract would be great for a lot of those players. But the, God's honest truth is a lot of these owners, most of these owners, could pay these players regardless. They can pay them if they make no money it, it, during the baseball season. These guys are literal billionaires, they can play, pay a lot of these guys. And I know that so many of these players are millionaires, but most of them aren't. Most of the, these guys are, are not making, you know, an exorbitant amount of money uh, just to play the game of baseball. To me, it just, it, it's almost like you're treating these athletes like they are not people. Like, these people still have to see their families. They have to be people. Um, and just because it, it's something that makes money and entertains people, I, look, we all could use a little bit more baseball. We could all use a little bit more entertainment during this period. But to, this is not what these players signed up for. When, when they decided to become Major League Baseball players, this is, this is not part of the agreement. Um, and it, it's not something that they ever thought would come to pass. I, I just don't think it's a... It, it, it kind of doesn't treat the players as people. And I know that the, the um, you know, it's, pro- it's not going to happen. It's almost definitely not going to happen. But the fact that they're willing to throw this out there and then you have, you, you get fans excited about it because they think, oh, baseball's coming back. And you ask them to look past the idea that you're throwing away these people's rights, essentially, in order to entertain people, um, just does not sit well with me at all. Rant over. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Hey, it's a good rant, uh, but I, I think like see why you're so heated about it. Like that's why I think it's just so ludicrous. Like there's no way. Like you said, it's not going to happen. Like that's why I, the more I thought about it, I was like, this is a joke. Like this cannot be how this goes p- p- proceed. Um, there's no way this will work, and like that's why I think it's more of a stepping stone. Okay, here's where we started. We've got some federal local government officials backing it up. We've got some people in Arizona backing it up, or at least open to the idea of discussing it and talking about it and more expanding on it. It has to be the starting spot. 
That's why I just, the more I thought about it, I was like, it's crazy. There's no way this would work. Everything you just said is correct. Um, and then to, to add on to that, to me, it's like, well, what, where is baseball on this high horse of thinking that they are the ones that are going to save America and, and be the ones, <laughs> you know, or the, or this world and be the ones to provide entertainment, the first sport to play things. It's like, no, you're, you're taking your own self-interest and putting it above. It seems it just has a bad look to it. That's what bothers me. Not so much that it's logistically not possible. Like I, I agree. Like the logistics of it are not going to work. It's just not going to happen. Like all the reasons you said, quarantine all the players. You're asking some of these players to then maybe pick up and move their entire families from across the country to play in Arizona for a couple months. Then you're also asking thir- uh, 28 teams to play outside in the middle of Arizona summer heat for, in the hottest part of the year for that part of the country for every game. And then you're also possibly playing uh, scheduled double headers in those games. You only have one indoor stadium. That makes no sense to me. So obviously to me, the more I thought about it, I was like, it's not going to happen. There's no way it's not possible. But then I got more upset about like, well, why does baseball think that they can be the ones? And I love base. I love baseball as much as the other guy. Like you and I are dying for some actual games to be looking for. I'm sure all the fans listening and watching um, for the Orioles and, and baseball in general are just dying for anything to be given. They're probably watching, you know, MLB the Show uh, uh, simulation games <laughs> or players play each other on Twitch, whatever it may be. We're dying for baseball, but that doesn't mean you get to put the safety of not only the players, their families, the coaches, the owners, the staff of the of the, the stadium, everyone in Arizona. Like, you're having people, you know, what if a player lives in New York and his family, which is a hot spot right now, obviously, or here in D.C. Uh, or Maryland, Baltimore, uh, uh, Governor Hogan just came out yesterday and said Baltimore is going to be the new epicenter yeah. uh, for the coronavirus. You're asking some of the players who have been living here to not, not just themselves, but take their whole family family move across the other part of the the other side of the country that may not be as infected i know arizona's right before below california but still like it, it's it's going to be a difficult it's a difficult ask and it's obviously not logistically possible that's why i kept going back to this is not going to work this has to be just you know it's just sort of something at the wall see if it sticks and like you said maybe get a public reaction and see, kind of build upon that uh but yeah I, I i got really upset where how baseball thought that they were you know, they're on this high horse of it. We're going to be the ones to say we're going to be the first ones uh, to come out and play games. Baseball is the best suited for this. It's the least contact. Okay, yeah, maybe it's the least contact of the four professional sports, but there's still a good amount of contact. What happens if someone gets on first base? Is the first baseman not allowed to cover him and, yeah. and keep him from stealing? Is Are, you're not, are you going to take away leads? Can the, the, does that player have to stay on the bag the entire time? Do you not steal? What happens if there's a throw at second? What happens if there's a collision at the plate? Uh, it's just it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to work. Yeah. So the fact that baseball come out and say, no, we can play as early as next month. Keep in mind, it's mid or early April. So they're planning on playing next month when local and federal government officials are saying that the next two weeks are going to be crucial to flattening the curve of this thing. How could you possibly consider playing a sport, let alone uh, having all these players and people who are affected by this game completely uplift their lives for a month at a time uh, and during all of this. It's just unrealistic yeah. to me. And then also you take into the medical thing. I know in Ken Rosenthal's piece, he mentioned that there was some, uh, some medical experts who said that, you know, the players would be tested regular regularly, but those tests would not be taken away from the general public. We already have trouble taking tests. You're going to take the few tests that we already have yeah. and only give them to professional baseball players just so they can keep playing. Absolutely absurd. So, yeah, uh, it was kind of upsetting. But to me, again, I think it's just a starting spot. You know, we know that the plan for baseball is to start as soon as possible. They want to play somewhat of a regular season. They want to play games. They want to have a World Series champion at some point uh, to as close to as normal as possible. Um, and to me, that's why this, this idea, this plan was just so absurd. But they had to start somewhere. Maybe the best place to start was to be the most – crazy you could be and then weed out all the crazy and try to get as close to normal as you can. Yeah. The first thing I thought of when I, you mentioned that uh, the fact that all those players are going to be literally the game requires you to be in close proximity. The fact that they threw out there, the idea that the umpire would be six feet back. I thought, well, what about the catcher? Like the catcher stands right next to the batter. You eliminate one person, but you still have somebody else there. 
Um, yeah. Pop fly and pop fly and right center field. Like those players come closer than six feet to each other. You know, what are you <laughs> going to say? No more collisions. How do you control that? Yeah. You can't do that. It's going to teach, you know what it'll do is it'll teach players to be better about calling off their teammates when they have a fly ball, you know, so that they and, don't have. And what, ha- <laughs> right, right. And what happens if you have a runner on second and, and the catcher and pitcher need to have a mound yeah. meeting to change up the signs. You have to stay six feet apart. So they're yelling on each other, the signs where everyone can hear. And then how yeah. does the, the pitcher get back into the quote unquote dugout or, I guess in this case the stands and have a meeting with the pitching coach and and change up the game plan or something. It, it's just unrealistic. I, yes, baseball is has the fewest has the the least contact of the four major sports, but it's still a sport. There has to be some close uh, contact between people at, at some point, yeah. like, whether with the opposing team or your own team. You know it, it, that's why they talk like this. They cover their mouth with the gloves because they have to get close enough to talk so the other team doesn't hear or see. Yeah, so, yeah it's just. There is an aspect to it that I don't think that they're quite overthinking. Oh, yeah, the ump can just stand six feet back. Oh, the catcher can stand three feet back, whatever it means. No, that's, that's not how the sports plays. Now, at that point, you're changing the complexion of the game, yeah. and that's what I don't think fans want. Well, and uh, the thing that bothered me also about this was, you know, a lot of comparisons have been made to the KBO, the Korean Baseball Organization, because they're now playing intra-squad games. Um, they're looking at late April, potentially, early May, to get back to a regular season in terms of baseball um, because they have been able to contain this thing um, at a way faster rate than we have at this point. Um, and, but the, the thing about it is if one person, one player, one coach, one staff member, one umpire tests positive in the KBO, they're shut down for two more weeks at least. And what was mentioned in the article is well, maybe Major League Baseball wouldn't have to do that because they would just take that guy out and replace him with somebody else. That is taking your most valuable commodity, which is the players, and you're devaluing them by saying, you know what, if uh, Mike Trout, you know, tests positive for coronavirus, this, this deadly disease, you can just grab a minor leaguer and throw him in there and everybody else in the Angels will be fine. No, <laughs> you would have to take the exact same precautions as the KBO. Well, Paul, forget about replacing the guy. What about if any player catches it? If you go through with this plan and any player catches it, that's automatic shutdown. That has to be an it automatic shutdown. Be. And yeah. just the worst PR for baseball. It's like, well, you should have done it in the first place. Yes. <laughs> you put these guys at risk, and here are the consequences. Your star, say it's Mike Trout, your, your, your base of your sport now con- uh, contracted this virus because you were selfish and wanted to play right. ball. And God forbid there's some kind of underlying condition that a player has that they don't know about, like they're, right. you know, and, and they contract it and they're in serious medical, uh, in a I mean, serious medical I, emergency. I know it's a sensitive situation and we're wishing, and he's recovering, wishing, but like take local here, Trey Mancini. No one knew what he was going through until this spring training. And then all of a sudden he's out for weeks at a time, having important surgery, something removed. You know, that is a, a perfect situation of an underlying medical condition that no one knew about. Yeah. And now you're exposing them to a, a potentially deadly virus. I mean, it's just, not not possible. Not exactly. Not, but it's a starting point. Like I said, I think it's a starting point. I think May. I even think June is optimistic. Uh, I'm looking. I really believe if they're going to play at all, it's going to be the second half, the later half of the summer. Yeah. Um, in a very condensed season. Uh, but there's no way they're playing in in a, in a month. Like that's just not going to happen. And I'm I'm taking the approach of uh, expect the worst, but hope for the best. You know, in terms of baseball. So. You know, yeah. expect yeah, almost that no games are played, but hope that somehow games are played at some point. It won't be like this. I just know that that's, that's the case, and it probably won't be May. Um, almost definitely won't be May. Um, all right, let's talk about some more uh, happy topics, which is our 20 and 20s. We're going through 20 players in the Orioles organization to keep your eye on in 2020 and beyond. Emphasis on beyond. Today, Bobby, we have two great ones Two young prospects in the Orioles system, Ryan Mountcastle and Grayson Rodriguez. Very different spots in the organizations. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, much closer to the bigs than Grayson Rodriguez. Uh, But both guys are considered to be top five prospects by most in the Orioles system. Um, A lot of outlets have them both as top 100 prospects. Let's start first and foremost with Ryan Mountcastle, who spent all of last season with the Norfolk Tides. His stats... He, in 127 games, he hit 312 with 25 homers and 83 RBIs. He uh, got International League MVP. 
just an absolutely incredible season for a guy that has done nothing but hit his entire minor league career, Bobby. Yeah, that's correct. And you also said a career highs in those home runs and RBI numbers that you, uh, you just said, and then add on his career high in slugging with the 527 slugging rating. Um, yeah, the bat has been there forever, and we've talked about this, Paul. You know, I, I think the bat was considered close to major league level two years ago in 2018, and then he comes out and has a monster season in 2019, uh, MVP of his, of, of his league, putting up career numbers. Uh, the bat has always been there. Ryan Mountcastle has, has got a pro-style major league level bat. Uh, the rating is there, too. Uh, but the question is with him is where do you put him in the lineup? And, and defensively, he was drafted as a shortstop. Uh, then he's played exclusively third base in the, in the minor leagues with the Orioles. Then they switched him to first base, and they tried him out in left field so much. Designated hitter is always an option in the American League once he gets up here. It's not a matter of if his bat plays, it's a matter of if his glove can play and if he can find a spot in the lineup every day. I think it's going to mostly be the Orioles' uh, major league roster is going to dictate when and where we'll see Ryan Mountcastle this season or whenever baseball's played. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in terms of his defensive position, we threw out there a, a poll on Twitter about where fans would – see his long-term defensive position. Look, the organization is still unsettled on that point. Um, I think it's it, the way that they played him in the field in 2019 kind of indicates that they they no longer pretty much see him as uh, a, a third baseman. And I think that they were maybe, you know, maybe eventually he could rediscover some of the tools that, that uh, were allowed him to be drafted as a shortstop. But to me, I think that, that kind of, it kind of speaks volumes that he did not play as the season went along. He played fewer and fewer games uh, at third base. So they started, they tried him out a little bit at first base, but a lot of time in left field. Um, it, it, to me, I think ultimately, based on what we've heard and, and what we've seen, his long term position in Major League Baseball will probably be a DH. Um, but obviously the organization is going to try to keep that um, from him as long as possible, not just because of the log jam that they have in terms of Chris Davis and Trey Mancini and these guys that are first baseman by trade, but there are so many of them, you know, that they're keeping him away. It's not just because of that. I think it's because they, once you put a guy in that hole and, and say that he is a DH, it's awfully hard to get him out of there. And then there becomes, anytime you play him in the field, after that, you know, it becomes a thing of, well, he's not, he doesn't play that position. He's a DH. So they want to keep that from him as long as possible. And I totally understand that. I don't know if he's going to be a left fielder in the future. I don't know if he's going to be um, a first baseman in the future. But I think um, if I had to guess, I think if this were a normal season, they would have started him out at Norfolk. Um, not worried too much about anything he does at the plate, but just focus on, all right, let's get a, a firm idea of what position we want this guy to play in the major leagues once he comes up. Right, and like you said, uh, in terms of the log jam, you can't knock, especially with the way Chris Davis was hitting at the beginning of spring training, you know, who knows what would have happened if the season would have started on time. And then you have Trey Mancini. I think Trey Mancini plays a larger role in to where Iron Man Castle fits if, if Trey is a part of your long-term plans, which at this point it seems like he is, then Ryan, then Ryan Mancus is not going to play first base. He's going to be stuck in the outfit or in that DH role. And I totally agree, Paul. Once you put Ryan Mancastle, or anybody for that matter, in the DH role, especially young, early on in his career, it's going to be harder and harder for him to transition back into a, into a, a fielding position. Like take Mark Trumbo, for instance, like all the way back to Nelson Cruz in 2015. Those guys were DH type that every time that – then Buck Showalter was forced to throw them out in the field. It was kind of like they're almost a liability. You know, they don't play that position every day. They don't have all the athletic tools or work on them on a daily basis to play those, that position, especially in the corner outfield. First base is probably the safest spot for him, um, as seen by and where the, the Orioles probably project him to play if he were to play in the field, uh, based on how much he played there last 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 year. But I, I, yeah, I think it's it's going to be a tough call. And like I said, it's the major league roster is going to dictate when and where he comes up, like when he eventually makes his debut with the Orioles and then where, where he's playing in the field and in the Orioles lineup um, as a DH or first baseman. I, I would doubt, I mean, he's still young. He's what? I have, um, 
23. 20, 23. He, you can throw him. He's probably athletic enough. You can probably throw him in the corner outfield if you absolutely have to. Um, but, yeah, again, it, it's to be determined. Um, I, I think you and I both agree we'll see him at some point whenever baseball starts, whether that's the 2020 season. If, if, if we were in a regular season, we thought we would see him this year. Yeah. Um, but ob- obviously it's not. So whenever baseball starts up again, we anticipate to see Ryan Mountcastle that year. Um, but it's just depending on where he'll play in the field. Um, and this also, just a quick note back to the, his like scattering report. This isn't to say that, right. I mean, we're, we're talking about his fielding a lot and we say that his bad is major league ready. It's not to say that he's perfect. You know, we're not anticipating him to hit a bunch of home runs. His strikeout rate went through the roof last year, actually. And his walk rate rate went down. So that's something to keep an eye on, but that happens a lot to young hitters too. Uh, but it's again, we're not overhyping this guy's bad. Uh, yes, it's major league ready, but don't expect him to become lighting the world on fire right out the gate because, you know, there is something for him, uh, a young guy to improve on. Yeah, there will be a learning curve. And, and um, we say it all the time that, the you know, teams want to avoid as steep a learning curve as possible. And when you have a guy coming up who could be playing a new position, if he's playing left field, that's still a fairly new position. He's going to be out in the field every day trying, you know, during, <laughs> during the day before a night game, trying to learn how to play that position at a higher level in addition to worrying about how to catch up to major league pitches um, and worry about right. that. So that they want to kind of eliminate that, which is why I thought if they started out the 2020 season on time, he would start bit down in AAA um, just to get a better idea of which position he would be playing. And then he would come up. I don't know. I, I was thinking if he, if he continued to hit the way he hit in 2019, maybe a, a May, late May, um, you know, early June call up if this were a normal season. Um, right at the start of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> at, th- at this point, who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I anticipated an early call up. The other thing is, the Orioles are in a, a somewhat in good position in terms of because they're not too worried in 2020 about winning games. Um, they don't necessarily. It, it's almost less of a concern if he takes his lumps. If if they put him out in left field and he takes his lumps there, because he's not going to cost you games, you know. And, and if he does, oh well. Um, But if they were a team that were fighting for a playoff spot, it's like, well, can you really have this guy out there playing left field if he could potentially cost you a game, um, you know, with a critical error or critical misplay of a fly ball? So the fact that they are not, were not set to compete in 2020 almost, um, almost would have helped that uh, if he was, were playing a new position. Yeah. Yeah. And he was already optioned down to AAA before spring training shut down. So Norfolk was probably his guaranteed his guaranteed starting spot, anyways. But yeah, uh, early start of the season, and then like you said, also too, it, because of where the Orioles are in this rebuild, it's not the worst thing in the world to bring him up at this point. And like you said, you know, kind of go through some rookie struggles and and learn about major league playing major league ball this early on in the season or in his career, uh, and then being them being not competitive is helpful as well because. There's, he's no real risk or liability. Yeah, he'll make some mistakes here and there. He'll probably chase a lot of balls to strike out a couple of times. But, you know, you can also see his potential, too. He has a lot of raw power, so he makes contact. And Camden Yards, too, that ball could fly out of there, and that'll impress some fans and some of the guys in the Orioles front office who, who want to see him succeed. And a an outfield of Ryan Mountcastle in left, Austin Hayes in center, and hopefully a, a healthy and safe Trey Mancini in right field. That's exciting. That's just exciting for <laughs> Orioles fans. Um, and you, you get a little bit of a glimpse into the future. You got a solid bat in, in Trey Mancini, obviously. That, you know, if, if those guys can, could hit the ground running, that could be an exciting outfield, at least for the short term. And then you move those pieces around. Absolutely. Um, all right. Let's get to Grayson Rodriguez, who is much lower in the organization, but he's a much more recent draft pick. First round pick by the Orioles a couple years ago. First off, the guy is huge. He's six foot five, two hundred and twenty pounds. Uh, we've had him in the web studio numerous times. We've had him up at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Um, he was drafted out of high school in Texas. He's got that little. Uh, uh, I remember he came in with crocodile shoes. He's got a great uh, fashion sense. Texas kind of uh, southern fashion sense already. The, the first thing that that before we get into his stats that I was always impressed with was his confidence. Um, the guy is clearly has the confidence to be a major leaguer. He's not soft-spoken. He knows when to, you know, when to speak up and when not to. Um, but he handles himself so well. We saw him interacting with fans. 
Um, the guy just gets it uh, and, and just knows what it takes to have the mentality, I think, um, of a major league player. Yeah, and I think that's part of his scouting report, too, is that he uh, it, it has a great mentality for a pitcher. He can learn on the fly. He can make adjustments. He's getting more comfortable on the mound, um, facing guys. Uh, you know, he's got a fastball that tops out at 97, uh, averages just over 95, with a 65 grading on a, a 2080 scale, which is pretty solid for a, a 20-year-old. Um, his low 80s slider, he's working that a little more, and he's he's getting a lot more confident in his changeup. I mean, he does have a curveball that's just behind his slider in terms of his velocity, but his changeup um, has improved a lot, and the scouts have noticed that he used to only exclusively throw it against left-handed hitters but he's getting a little more confident throwing against righties as well um, and using it as an out pitch, which is impressive. And that just goes to show, like you said, he has the mentality of a pitcher. He has the ability to adjust in-game, in on the mound, uh, make adjustments, attack hitters, set guys up, record outs. Uh, he just has the great mentality for a, a starting pitcher, a front-line kind of guy that you would want to see. And, and it's crazy that he's showing these flashes, these characteristics at such a young age, having only pitched at Del Marvo. Now let's get into the interesting stats because I got some interesting notes here, Bobby. Uh, the stats are are pretty outstanding. So he made 20 starts. It was his first full season of professional baseball. Uh, he went 10-4 and four, uh, in 94 innings pitched, a 2.86 ERA, a whip under one, 12.4 strikeouts per nine innings. He allowed four homers all season long, uh, which is kind of ridiculous in today's day and age. Um, so he kept... He struck out 34% of the hitters he faced, more than a third. He had more strikeouts than John Means did, despite having 61 fewer innings pitched. Obviously, much different league and much different spot, but that just shows you how he was able to to get guys to miss bats. He had three blow-up starts, basically, over the course of that 20-start season. He had one in June, one in July, one in August. So he spread them out. Every other start. He allowed two runs or fewer in every other start. He struck out at least five in all but three starts. And fun fact, he allowed only six stolen bases all season long, which probably helps when you keep guys off the bases. But uh, just some yep. mind-boggling stats, just showing you know the kind of year uh, that Grayson Rodriguez had to en route to getting co-minor league Orioles pitcher of the year and sharing that with uh, Michael Bauman. Yeah, and I think those stats goes to show there. Those are you know hard facts, hard statistics that you can go and point to, like and kind of show like yeah, he does. He's learning on the fly. Um, he's good at setting up hitters. He's good at making adjustments on the mound. They're very consistent throughout. Like you said, only three blowouts, blow up starts, one every month. And, you know, no no real consecutive bad starts. Um, every other start allowed two runs or fewer. The consistency that he was showing throughout his numbers. Uh, over the course of the year is impressive at a, for a young pitcher. And the fact, and it just goes to show the mentality that he has is it, just, he's just it, you know, he kind of has that factor that you look for a pitcher where he was like, I'm going to attack you. I know how to set you up. I know what I want to do. And I I'm confident in doing that. And I'm going to repeat it and I'm going to keep going and going. I know, you know, it's coming, but I'm going to make it work and get you out. Um, those numbers are mind boggling for a young pitcher. And, and the fact that it, it just goes to show that uh, the Orioles, uh, staff did a good job of selecting him and are are right and entrusting a lot in this guy in, in terms of their future uh in terms of his starting spot if, if 2020 were a normal season i kind of went bold and i i based on the season that he he had he's not going to go back to, he wouldn't have gone back to delmarva i don't think um yeah. i think he, he proved that he's better than that i could see him getting the call up to double a buoy and skipping right over uh high a frederick um you know you don't want to call a guy up before he's ready to any any level, let alone the major leagues. But um, I think he's ready for double A. And I think that uh, based on his stats, he is still 20. So he's still young. But I, I don't know. I, to me, I don't, I don't think that there's that much of a gap between in talent between high A Frederick and uh, high, and single A Delmarva. So I say just challenge the guy, send him to double A. That would be my take. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, you sound like you're a little more bullish on him than I am. I, I don't think that the Orioles want to. I mean, again, he's 20 years old. We're this close to a rebuild. You're not, you don't expect him to make his debut even next year. At least I don't. I don't think the Orioles do either. 
Um, I would expect him to start at Frederick. And, and it's not just because – not that he doesn't deserve to go to Bowie or get the try, but there's – we already talked about a couple of times on this podcast, and, and I think we've, we've seen Steve Molesky write about him on the MadisonSports.com blog as well. There's a log jam at starting pitching in, in Bowie. And some of those guys, yes, will go to Norfolk, but someone has to pitch in Bowie too. You know, stay back and, and pitch with a Bay Sox. So is there going to be room for him at the start of the season – to go to Bowie right, right away. I think you give him a couple starts at Frederick, see how he does. You're right. I don't know if there's too much of a uptick between uh, Abdel Marva and Frederick, but, you know, we talked about uh, Caden Grenier last last week, and, you know, he struggled once he got to Frederick. So maybe you see the same with pitching. Throwing him to Bowie right away seems uh, a little aggressive for me. I, I, would, I would start him at Frederick, see how he starts off, get his feet wet a little bit in a little higher competition, and then, uh, thrust them into the rotation once a spot opens up because someone's going to start has to start there and they'll make their way to Norfolk because someone in Norfolk will have to make their way to the major league roster at some point. That's just the way that this is going to work this year uh, or whenever baseball is played. So I would give him a start at Frederick with the keys real quick uh, early on in the season and then see if he makes his way to Bowie or earns his way up to Bowie, which I'm sure he would. Like we just said, his consistent numbers are strong and he has the right mindset to go ahead. Yeah. I think I was just salivating at the idea of a, a DL hall and Grayson Rodriguez staff led uh, down in Bowie. That would be just so exciting. Um, but yeah, I, you, you mentioned those, those, that log jam in terms of starting pitching. I think it is kind of a domino effect because um, you know, you have down at the Bowie level, you had Zach Lowther, Alex Wells and Michael Bauman, all of whom you could make a case that they deserve to get called up to Norfolk and then right. at the Norfolk level, you have a Dean Kramer, a Keegan Aiken, um, you know, guys that potentially could be major leaguers, but if they're not ready, and I think what we saw from them in spring training, they're probably not ready, they would be down in the Norfolk rotation. So do you want a super stacked Norfolk rotation at that point? Um, you know, if you're, you may not be getting the guys you want enough starts or enough innings. Um, but it, these are all good problems to have. These are all problems that the Orioles have, yeah. have not had in years in right. terms of having a, a, exactly. a starting pitching this deep um, in their farm system. But it's it's all very exciting. And next week we're going to uh, hop on another guy, D.L. Hall, that uh, had a great year down at Frederick. And could he be on his way to Bowie next year uh, or, or whenever his baseball is played in 2020? That'll be next week. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us here uh, on the Mass and All Access podcast. A well-lit Bobby uh, on uh, uh, at Bobby underscore Blanco, of course, on Twitter. I'm at Paul Mancano. Um, keep those comments, those reviews, suggestions, uh, ratings, all that good stuff going. Uh, we appreciate you guys sticking with us. We hope you, wherever you're watching from, you're safe, you're healthy, you're with your family, you're home, you're staying inside, even though it is absolutely gorgeous outside. Um, Baseball will come back at some point. These, these beautiful days are kind of teasing us um, because I'm just imagining baseball being played on these days. But uh, baseball, baseball will come back. We will, uh, we will persevere, Bobby. Yeah, we will. Thanks for having me, Paul. Good job of uh, producing and hosting at the same time once again. You're getting better at it. We're looking good. I look lit. And, um, <laughs> yeah, everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, try to keep entertained, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, we will uh, we will be back in just about a week as I get the uh, the final credits ready here. Hold on. <laughs> All right. We'll see you later.